Well, good morning. That was certainly a fresh and energetic way to get us started. Uh, so welcome um, to each and every one of you. I am simply thrilled to be here today and quite honored to have the opportunity to open the 2019 Move the Dial Global Summit. Move the Dial has always had a very, very special place in my heart. As a longtime mentor and advisor to Jody Kovitz, I've seen it grow from an idea into a global movement and witness firsthand the impact it has had on the tech community specifically, but on the advancement of women in business more generally. There's no doubt that the tech and innovation sector is making progress in its diversity and inclusion efforts, but women still account for only 25% of Canada's tech sector. And while the sector continues to grow at a very rapid pace, the participation of women has remained quite stagnant for the past decade. And surveys show that 50% of women in Canada still don't think that tech companies really want to hire them. What does all this mean? It means we have so very much work to do, which of course brings us to this morning. Move the Dial has brought us all together today because they believe that the solutions to underrepresentation and retention of women in the tech space can be developed right here, right now, by all of us. And I completely agree. My own journey is one that's made me both determined, more determined, and more optimistic about the future. I grew up a very, very long time ago um, in Oshawa, back in the day when it was a small town, not at the end of the GO train line. Uh, finishing high school, uh, there wasn't a lot we thought about as, as young women there. Uh, there were a few things people thought we could do. Uh, we could be teachers, we could be a nurse, homemaker, secretary, or a nun. It was a very long time ago. But I was, uh, went off to university, something of an, uh, an anomaly in our town, and, and certainly in my family, the first to do that. But once there, I realized there was so much else I could occupy my time with. I quickly changed my major from English and history. I was going to be a teacher. And when I graduated four years later uh, with a degree in political science and economics, I had only one ambition, which was to find the longest postgraduate degree in existence. <laughs> and then to get in, and so I did. Heading off then to do my law degree at Osgoode Hall and then my MBA at the Schuller School of Business. By that point in time, this is the early 80s, there were plenty of women, when I say plenty, 20 to 30 percent, uh, enrolled in the law and business schools, but very, very few in the joint program. There was usually one woman per year in a, in a relatively small class. My studies from there took me to a, a career in securities law and M&A. Back then, and maybe even still today, quite a male-dominated uh, area of law. But that didn't deter me. I accepted that I would just need to work harder and stand out more. You see, some things never change. And so I did. The next step and opportunity was when I had a chance to move to Four Seasons to become the number two in the law group at Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts, now the world famous uh, Just For Me Now service uh, and luxury hotel group. Sounds like a very glamorous job, I know, but that's until I tell you that this was 1989, it was a very small company, and I was the number two in the two-person law department. <laughs> and again, here I was, um, surrounded by and, and dominated um, in a world uh, that was occupied by men. Over the years, I worked my way up through the business. I became the first woman to serve on the executive committee. Then I became one of the only women in the world to work in the hotel development space. Then I was the first woman president of a major hotel chain, and then I became the CEO. <laughs> my next chapter started in 2013 after I left Four Seasons. Uh, I began my life as a professional director, and I was asked to become the chair of the board of the Royal Bank of Canada, making me the first woman to chair the board of a major bank. And 
And most recently, I've been appointed as chair of a private equity firm here in Toronto, Altus Partners. Uh, you want to talk about a male-dominated industry, um, private equity is it. I think making me again um, one of the first women, um, if not the only one, to do that. So I tell you all this um, for why. Clearly not to claim credit. Um, I tell you so that there's absolutely no doubt about two things. There were so very many people and so very many things in my life that helped me move my dial. And also, I tell you, because there were so many lessons along the way that I think are helpful in no matter what industry you're in. The first thing I would say is that firsts still matter. They still matter really a lot. Because as women, we have so much more ground to cover to advance our careers and those of the people around us. Role models are key to this progress. I always say that if you can see something, you can probably do it. And if any of the things that we, as senior women, have done that happen just by observation to inspire someone else to get on with their dreams, then our work is partly done. Another important lesson is the need to always harness the power of tenacity confidence and resilience. As I rhymed off all those stepping stones of my career, it might have sounded like it was a pretty smooth progression, one without big effort or big drama. But nothing could be farther from the truth. The fact is, when you get to my age, our personal accomplishments are always viewed with the benefit of a rearview mirror, where everything seems larger than it's supposed to appear, uh, and than it originally was. I told you those stories um, about my progression of four seasons. In fact, my very first promotion was promised and denied, relating to economic factors, a recession in the early 90s. Uh, that moment when I joined the management committee as the first woman uh, rose out of a little bit of a crisis where I was caught unawares of a very, very important matter that I needed to know about as the general counsel. And I went to my bosses and said, this is unacceptable. I can't spend my reputation this way. You've got to put me in the inner circle or I can't do my job. And so they did. And ultimately, um, my biggest promotion was not the one that, that came when I became the CEO. It was one two or three before that, where we were doing some long-term succession planning at the company. And I was told kind of on the side that a man, my peer, would be promoted to the next level to prepare him for future service as a, as a more senior executive. And I was incredibly disappointed. Not that he'd gotten that job. He was very, very qualified. I was super disappointed to find out that my name wasn't even in the conversation. And so I went to my boss. He sent me to the CEO. And I said, I want to be considered too. I want to think about a long-term career here. Ultimately, a few months later, with a, a few more planned discussions around it, um, I got that promotion. The fellow who got it first left to become the president of Starbucks. His replacement was 10 years older than me. The two of us ran the company together for six years. He retired. I became the boss. So the reality is not that rearview mirror at all. It's that we have to fight hard for our seat at the table. We have to really, really push to have our voices heard. We have to have the tenacity to ask and ask again and again for the career opportunities that we not only want, but that we deserve. And we have to have the resilience to carry on when we suffer a disappointment and, of course, develop our own particular brand of confidence to sometimes get both in and out of our own ways. The third lesson for today is harnessing the power of those around you. Success in business and in life I believe, is a team sport. So make sure that you have the best team. The best teammates at work and among your friends and family. The best life partner, if that's what you choose to do. One that thinks that you can be even better than you think you can be. And the best trainers and the best coaches, to stick with the sports analogy. People you can learn from and who can help guide you and grow you making you stronger. I had many of these in my life, many, many, uh, but not nearly enough, and none of them were women. It's one of the reasons that today I spend all of my free time mentoring aspiring young leaders. In fact, that's how I met Jody. 
uh, so many years ago through our work at SickKids. After just a few minutes um, of talking together, Jody asked me if I would mentor her. And I said yes, because I always say yes. But then everybody gets one meeting. To get a second meeting, you have to do the work. You have to do the homework, and you have to follow through on the goals that we set together. There's such a ripple effect of this too, right? The effect of choosing to invest in another person around you, beside you, and, and help them to rise up and do the homework too. The impact of a single mentoring session can have exponential effects on the lives of people that you don't even interact with. In fact, I remember uh, with Jody sitting at my kitchen table, it was December of 2017. She was then at a crossroads in her career, trying to decide whether she had the wherewithal to launch and build, move the dial into uh, what it is today from a grassroots, volunteer-based side hustle, as she calls it, into uh, really a global movement. I remember telling her then um, that what I saw in her was enormous potential and the magic beans, right? She had something very special inside her um, that was propelling her forward to this, uh, to this calling. Her face always lit up when she talked about this, not so much when she talked about some of the alternatives. Um, and she shared with me since that it was that moment sitting in the, in the kitchen over a glass of wine that changed the trajectory for her, and it's why all of us are here today. The power of belief in another human is absolutely magic. Uh, their potential, every single one of us in this room, is capable in some way of paying it forward. And so back to our work. As we enter 2020, we're not only entering a new year and a new decade, we have an opportunity and, I would argue, a responsibility to start this decade with a fresh approach, one that has, sees us making plans, sees us setting targets, and sees us expecting accountability from everyone for truly including the lived experience of experiences of all humans in the work we do. It's time uh, that we go, as today's theme calls out, that we go all in for each other. As part of a collective all, we have tremendous power to ignite change if we rally together. If we wish to see change in our ecosystems, if we wish to see advancements in tech and innovation products, we need to ensure that everyone has a seat at the design table. Each of us can play a major role in shifting the tech ecosystem simply by being dedicated to going all in. We need to go all in for all of us. So I challenge you today and tomorrow, and for all the tomorrows after that, not to just be a summit attendee, but also to be an agent of change. Use today as an opportunity to learn, to listen, and to obtain knowledge that can help you build your career. Today, push yourself to go all in, immerse yourself in each and every element of the summit, because the future of tech and the future generally is here in this room. And if we lean all the way in, I know for sure that we can move the dial. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the day.